Let me just kind of continue where I left off, but somebody's not here yet, and it was kind of her question. So. You don't remember? Okay. Uh, first one is Sabe Dhamma Nalang Abhinive Seya. All phenomena ought not to be uh, clung to. Or there's nothing worth clinging to. Then uh, the next are three terms that Ajahn Buddhadasa often discussed together sunyata and he preferred to translate it voidness it's often translated emptiness tathata thusness or suchness which he translated into a very ordinary Thai phrase chenan eng which means something like just like that, or kind of it, how in English we'd say, it's just how it is. And itapachayata, which is, I translated conditionality, some translators translated specific conditionality. Pachaya means condition, and ida means this. So it's literally the state of having this as condition. And some people take that this in a certain way and translate it specific conditionality. There might be some other poly words, but we'll we'll see if they come up. So I'd like to pick up with Itapajayada and follow through on the discussion around nature and ethics. So to to recap, Dhamma is nature, nature is Dhamma. And if we look deeply into any manifestation of Dhamma, which by the way is called a Dhamma, like in the first one, phenomena, um, there's Dhamma as a whole, and there's each specific expression, manifestation of Dhamma, which we often call things or phenomena. If we look deeply into these, we realize that they're, they all follow or are subject to certain natural laws, such as impermanence, and there's there's no phenomena that isn't connected with causes and conditions. Although, in a way, Nibbana is, is not connected with causes and conditions in the usual ways. And then, with the ongoing impermanent flow of causes and conditions, everything that happens has a function or duty specific to the the moment. Though the notion of duty, Ajahn Buddhadasa would also point to uh, the kind of broad, lifelong duty of life is the end of suffering. So the the practice of Dhamma for the sake of ending suffering. And some of us were talking a little bit about Bodhijita over lunch, and I'd like to point out that in the original teachings of the Buddha it doesn't say who's suffering. In the Four Noble Truths, it's suffering, the cause of suffering or dukkha, the end of dukkha and the path leading to the end of dukkha. There's no mention of whether it's my dukkha or your dukkha 
our dukkha or their dukkha. Often we take it as my dukkha, of course. That's what matters. Other people's dukkha, you know, is a little less uh, bothersome to us until somehow it becomes our dukkha. But the Buddha didn't didn't personalize dukkha that way. It's it's about dukkha. I, I think it's important not to get caught up into making it my dukkha or somebody else's dukkha. Now, to connect this with Buddhist ethics, the, we're often familiar with the five sila, often explained as the five precepts. But in a way, the early Pali language, it'd be more appropriate to call them trainings, sika. Um, So I prefer to think of them as five trainings rather than precepts, although the the literal meaning of precept fits. Ajahn Buddhadasa liked to point out that the common element or the, the underlying principle of all the precepts is non-harming. That, and that this is the, the essence of Buddhist ethics. The Pali word is awihingsa. We're more familiar with the Sanskrit ahingsa. It's pretty much the same word. It often is translated nonviolence, but it as much means non-harming, non-abuse, non-oppression, as well as non-violence. So, Buddhist ethics are basically about living in a way that does not do harm. And it's it's not just about not harming others, it's as much not harming ourselves. Themes that are very important in the early Buddhist teachings are to not do harm and do benefit. There are places where the Buddha gives very simple guidelines on action. When is an action worth following out or carrying out? When you are confident that it will not harm anyone and will do some benefit. It may be that somebody else benefits or you benefit. As long as it does benefit and nobody harms, it's ethically okay. It's selfish when you benefit and somebody else is harmed. But if it's, it's fine to do things that are healthy and beneficial, like exercise and meditation, as long as you're not harming someone else. So Buddhist ethics boils down to non-harming. In the way this fits with the perspective on nature that I've just been talking about is Nature is all this phenomena interconnected through causes and conditions. When we look at the aspect of nature, which is human behavior, we see that our actions arise out of causes and conditions. Our actions have consequences. And we see that the world we live in is a relational world. There's not, none of us exist alone or in a vacuum. And there are, that's another fairly common theme in early Buddhism. That conventionally we may exist as individuals, but we're also individuals who have parents, maybe students, employers, employees, friends, teachers, children, that it's impossible to be only an individual. The individual is just a convention. 
and we're, we're tied into relationships. If this is the reality of our lives, then to live ethically is just a simple consequence of accepting the relational, conditional aspect of our existence. So these ethics are seem seem to be natural because it arises out of the way things are. We we can't do anything in this world by ourselves. Our food, transportation, most of the stuff we use involves other people, involves ecosystems, other living beings. Therefore, we have a responsibility to live in this world without doing harm. So that's, that's the basic connection between Dhamma as nature. That it's a nature that is relational. Another aspect of this that Ajahn Buddhadasa liked to bring up is the the way that the word sila is explained in the Pali schools in Thailand is using a word pakati, um, a Pali word, and pakati or in Thai bokati. Pakati means something like natural and normal, if you put the two together. So, Pakati is the natural, the way we would say in English, the, the natural way of things or the natural order. And the sense of normal here is not normal according to, you know, you take a, a sampling of people and work out the average. The the Buddhist notion of normal is from the perspective of the Buddha. So, Pakati is in terms of the Buddha's awakening, not normal as to what the conventional wisdom is on Wall Street or in some newsroom, but it's, it's according to natural law and Buddha's awakening to natural law or natural truth. And the highest pakati is nibbana, the coolness when there's no greed, hatred, or delusion. We don't often have, we don't often hear the connection between nibbana and the precepts stress except that supposedly the precepts are a foundation for meditation. And there's kind of vague ideas. If you meditate enough, you will you might get awakened or enlightened or something. But there's, there's this other perspective, and it's more than linguistic, that in a way, the precepts are a behavioral expression of non-harming, non-greed, non-hatred, non-delusion. By the way, that's the the most common way the Buddha talked about Nibbana was not metaphysical. It was meant to be very practical. The end of greed, the end of hatred, the end of delusion, the end of suffering. <clears throat> so to be normal in this perspective is to live out one's relationships in ways that are beneficial and don't do harm. And because those are not only human relationships but are relationships with other forms of life, ecosystems, and society, Part of our practice, part of 
Buddhist ethics is about living in society in a way that doesn't do harm. In the past, Buddhist ethics and especially the five precepts were often understood in a village context where the way of life and the economy and the politics were rather simple. And so it was okay or fitting to discuss the precepts or ethics in a rather simple way. In the village, you don't you don't kill, you don't beat people up, you don't steal, uh, you don't mess with other people's wives, husbands, kids, you don't lie, and you avoid alcohol and things that will cloud your judgment and lead to the, the uh, difficulties with the first four. We now live in a much more complex situation, but many Buddhists are reluctant to upgrade their understanding of the precepts to something beyond a very individualistic understanding. Um, my take, and I think Ajahn Buddhadasa would agree with this, although he didn't spell it out as quite like I will, is that in our current situation, we don't, we don't live in those villages anymore. We, we eat food. This, I don't know about California, but most of the country eats food that much of which is trucked long, long distances or flown in even, comes from other countries. And even if most of our food is grown, in, a lot of our food's grown in the valley or something. There's all the clothes we get from Central America, uh, Bangladesh and places like that. All those, probably half our closets are stuff from China nowadays. So just these facts of modern life mean that the, the scope of our ethics has gotten a whole lot more complex. Um, which makes it very much harder to take in. Village level ethics is a lot easier to understand because you can, you see the people you're affecting. Nowadays we, we don't. So it makes it often much more tricky. <clears throat> but I, I think it still boils down to the same principle of non-harming and so, uh, given some of our cultural debates in the U.S. nowadays where there's a very important and often vocal segment of the population that believes if you don't believe in God the way they do, you can't be moral. And they have their take on certain issues derived from their belief in God. I... Um, I don't think I'm getting off topic too much to put forth my own personal uh, view, which is I think in Buddhism we're fortunate to have a fairly robust and common sense pragmatic ethics that doesn't require belief in a supreme being. And But yet there's a acceptance of what we might call um, I'm spacing out for a moment what do they call it in AA um, higher power the, in a way the law of nature is the Buddhist version of higher power and so I think the kind of approach to ethics that I've been summarizing can bridge the more theistic view of some of our Christian friends, although some of them won't listen, so it's hard to bridge, but the ones at least who will listen and talk. And the other large segment of our population that's very secular and doesn't really want religion 
messing around with their lives. This, the question about Buddhism in America, this is one of the places I think Buddhism can mature into a, a kind of mediating role between parts of our society that I think are increasingly and perhaps violently polarized. So, a bit of a, well, it's actually not a digression because it spoke to one of the uh, issues somebody brought up. So that's what I wanted to say about nature and ethics. Anybody want to, was is that enough on that or any questions? Do we need to stand up and do jumping jacks or something? I'm, is it just me? I'm feeling kind of... It's not so good if we just come back from lunch and we're all kind of... <laughs> Could you wait for the microphone? I read a quote from Buddha Dasa, and I think it went something like this. Someone asked him, what is Nibbana? And he said, it's just acting appropriately each moment. Are you familiar with that quote? Is that? And somehow that um, relates to sila, I think, for me. Yeah, and it's, see, for him, almost everything connects to Nibbana one way or the other. There's a, there's a, a traditional Theravada view of their sort of basic teachings, like Dana and Sila. And sometimes those are treated as sort of stepping stones to higher practices, like meditation and Vipassana and whatever. He liked to see everything, whether it's simplicity, dana, generosity, sila, as more of a, a spectrum where you can, you can hook in at whatever level. But if you take sila all the way, which goes way beyond precepts, you know, sila outgrows the precepts. It doesn't do away with the precepts. It just doesn't have to formulate itself that way. And then the ultimate sila is nibbana. You know, it's interesting. I'm just sort of free free forming right now. But if if it's appropriate action, nibbana being the absence of the three characteristics, anicca, anatta, and dukkha. You know the the extinguishing of those heats, if you will, um, and how sila would progress, you know, beyond the the precepts into um, purity. Um, mm -hmm. Well, yeah. traditionally, the word purity would come in a lot, although it's purity of the precepts, purity of mind, purity of view, like in the. This Sudhi Maga, the path of purity. So you can definitely see it that way. Um, the the quote you you brought up sounds familiar. A slightly different form that that I can think of right now is that um, I probably misquoted it. If the monks live rightly the world won't be empty of arahant. It's somewhat similar, but not exactly the same. But the notion of living rightly, the, the world won't be free of awakened beings. And here living rightly is not just behaviorally, but it's internal. And it's it's how we how we view things. Do we view the world as substantial objects that can be owned, controlled, 
as you and me? Or do we see it all as impermanent, as interrelated, and not worth clinging to as me and mine? I just want to ask again, um, that statement, if, if it's true about being appropriate, seems to me to um, imply a kind of intuition and maybe, you know, perceiving perceiving from a position of I or mine would be the antithesis of that intuitive connection, perhaps it's even a connection. Mm-hmm. Yeah, when we let go of me and mine, that whole agenda drops away and it's a lot easier to see what to do. Although, again, we've created a a world that is so complicated. Some of the stuff we do every day, it's, it's clear. But there are some issues facing us that aren't very clear because they're so complex. But still, relaxing me and mine is will help us deal with the complexity and not make it just even more confused. I, that's my own take. I think there are things now that I, I think in the Buddha's time or even Thailand a couple hundred years ago, things were a lot simpler. And now so much of what affects our lives are tied into these global systems that it's much more difficult to understand what the right thing is to do. Just should we be driving cars nowadays? No, is not an easy question in my mind. What do you want to do next? Oh. So do you think that it's harder in our complex world to achieve some level of enlightenment in terms of acting with the highest sila because of the complexity of our lives. Um, Probably. Again, I think it's how much we buy into the complexity. And by buying into, I don't mean it's a matter of whether you have a computer or not, or whether you live in the city or the country, but it's our attitude towards that complexity. Because you, you can, we can be rather militant in denying the complexity, and I'm not sure that that helps either. So, but to, I, it seems pretty obvious to me to the degree we entangle ourselves in the complexity, believe we need it, become dependent on it, then it's going to have a, a big effect. I'm not wishing it away because even I'm not sure what the consequences of that would be. Although global warming may just sweep away a lot of stuff and we'll just have one nice big mess. But but I'm not sure about that either. <laughs> so. Can you help us to understand... Um, Buddha Dasa's thinking um, that has contributed to um, the way we in the West 
understand socially engaged Buddhism? I'm not, well, maybe, but I'm I'm not sure how we in the West understand in socially well, engaged. Well, your understanding. Um, okay, that I can talk about, which. I think it was Jack brought up Dhammic socialism, which uh, unsurprisingly ties back into the themes we just talked about, about nature and ethics. He, 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 liked, he liked to say that nature is basically a cooperative, and he used the same... He used the word cooperative in the way we would speak of a co-op. And so he used the same word that had to do with the certain ideas of cooperative uh, farming, more cooperative marking coming out of Germany in the uh, 50s and 60s or whenever. But he was also influenced by what he had read of Marxism or when the Communist Party of Thailand was still active, one of its main bases was in the general area of Suan Mok and some of the some of the underground guys would come to Suan Mok for chat. So Ajahn Buddhadasa was in a unique position of having both generals and uh, the, the enemy coming to see him. And he was often asked to take sides and refused to do so because he didn't think either side had a monopoly on evil or, or virtue. So back to cooperatives. He saw that human beings are based Nature is basically, a co- he called it a cooperative endeavor due to the interrelatedness that we've been talking about. And he thought of society as um, basically socialist. Now here the Thai, the Thai way of translating socialism, ism words are translated by the Thai word niyom which is from the Pali word niyama. Niyama means kind of order, like in social order or the natural order. Niyom in Thai though means kind of to have a preference for or to be on the side of. So they translated socialism as sankom niyom to to be on the side of society or to have a preference for society. And that's contrasted with individualism, which was seen as a major component of modern capitalism, that it sets individual property, individual desires, individual whatever, takes precedence over society. So his understanding of socialism was that socialism means society is given some preference over the individual. And now we all know how that can, most of us are aware of examples when that can go way wrong. But the, the limit on that is that for him, he spoke of Dhammic socialism, which means a kind of socialism that's grounded in an understanding of Dhamma, such as the things we just talked about, that kind of ethics. Second, it supports Dhamma. So a kind of socialism that that creates space and opportunities for people to study and practice. It's a social and it's a socialism that does not do harm. He was critical of Marxism because he thought it was basically revenge motivated. He used those words. He called it bloodthirsty, vengeful um, communism. 
And he was equally or even more critical of capitalism because he thought it was greed and selfishness run amok. And so he was trying to advocate something in between. But he felt that uh, capitalism was more inherently based on selfishness. Whereas socialism was deep down had some compatibility with Dhamma more more than capitalism. So that's just one expression of how he saw engaged Buddhism and that using this terminology was a response to the polarized situation that was happening in Thailand in the 60s and erupted into a lot of violence in the 70s, including major massacres of students in in Bangkok, some of it extremely brutal. Although Thailand, there weren't so many killed in direct fighting like in other countries, uh, the Thai military advised and supplied by the U.S. killed thousands of people and don't really know the numbers. And that was usually in ones and twos. And unfortunately, that kind of thing is resurfaced with the, the violence around the Muslims in southern Thailand. And we tend, the press mainly covers the stories of the, the Buddhists who are killed by Muslims. But there are numerically more Muslims have died at the hands of supposedly Buddhist soldiers under the direction of a supposedly Buddhist prime minister. But, but due to censorship and things like that. Oh, I should admit the, the prime minister just got coup d'etat out of power, uh, tried to present himself as a student of Ajahn Buddhadasa. Some of us were not thrilled by that. But, you know, he sure didn't behave like it. So. Now, how much that's impacted the West, I, I, I'm doubtful but it is, it's one of the lines of thinking where, where he's, he in Thailand pioneered a way of thinking about Dhamma that was supportive of progressive social work. Though at the same time, in some ways, you could, he was somewhat conservative, so he doesn't fit easily into American ideas of left and right, progressive, conservative. And I think his, probably his biggest influence in Thailand was environmental partly because of the connection between Buddhism and nature that makes a lot of sense to most Thais. It was much more acceptable for Thai monks to be involved in environmental or ecology work. Something that was more overtly political was always frowned on. Um, but it was relatively safe. And I have many friends, monk, monks, who are, have various environmental projects. Although also one, a friend of, a former student of mine was murdered a little over a year ago, largely over um, land that he and some other friends, students were trying to protect. And there's We've been, people in Thailand and some of us um, outside of Thailand have been
calling on the Thai government to do a proper investigation, but they, <clears throat> they keep promising to do it, but they, they don't. And it's because it's believed the, the people who hired the killers have, um, have very good political connections, and so they'll never be investigated. I'd like to hear somebody else talk. <laughs> it would be good to hear some personal reflections or... But. Uh, continuing on the theme, um, what was Buddhadasa's, Ajahn Buddhadasa's uh, position in relationship to women as being able to practice uh, equality and Dharma practice and in society. His his take or his things he said both publicly or in private discussions, because I brought this up with him a few times, it's a kind of a mixed bag, at least from the perspective of a, a modern feminist. On one hand, uh, the nuns at Suen Mok tended to play a subservient position, which is often the case in Thailand. But when there were nuns who were able to teach, he was quite happy to have them teach. And one of the main teachers at Suen Mok during the years I was there was, was a nun. Um, now, part of the reason she taught and other nuns didn't was background. Her name's Ajahn Ranjuan, and she she had been a university professor and had quit, retired, and went to live with Ajahn Chah for a while. And then after Ajahn Chah got sick, she came to Suen Mok. And so... He didn't have a fixed idea about women being able to teach or not. But within his culture and experience, there weren't so many women teachers. On the other hand, so he, he like many of us, tended when we'd think of a Dhamma teacher, would think of men, because that's what there we were used to. On the other hand, he he often mentioned Ajahn Sujin, who is a well-known teacher. She had a radio program for many years, for like two or three decades. I think she's still alive. Do you know? Um, she's a so-called Abhidhamma teacher. But Ajahn Buddhadasa liked her because she was clear. She had practical examples um, in so he acknowledged women as teachers. Some of you probably have heard of, um, I forget uh, how Venerable Tanisaro gives her name, Ajahn Gi, um, Nanyanon. Or In Thai, she's known as Ga Kausuan Luang. So she's, um, and Venerable Tanisro has translated some of her books. Maybe you've, do you know Tanisro down in Wat Mei Thai? He's been here. Yeah, Tan Jeff. And anyway, some of her books are in English and Ajahn Buddhadasa was, supported her in her early years. Not financially, but they corresponded and he had some influence on her teaching. So there was those pieces. When it came to ordination of women, he kind of hedged it because I was kind of saying, yeah, it's time for bikunis. And he, he kind of tried to find a middle between advocating for bikuni ordination because he didn't think the senior monks would go for it. And so far he's 
that's proven to be the case. So, what he did at Suen Mok, although it hasn't quite worked out the way I think he intended it to, he set aside a part of the monastery for women to be able to practice, study and practice full time without having to do the usual cooking and cleaning stuff. So, that's been one of the differences in Thailand for a man to go in the monastery especially as a monk, but you could, you didn't have to do as much work. But in many monasteries, if you wanted to stay as a, a nun, a white-robed eight precept nun or machi, you had to do, you had to stay pretty busy working. And so it wasn't really, it was, it was viable for women who wanted to live in the monastery and serve but it wasn't very supportive of, as supportive of study and practice as it could be. So he, he created something at Suen Mok called Dhamma Mothers, uh, for women, both younger and also, it's, it's common in Thailand that some women, there are a lot of professional women who didn't marry, and then, some retire, get interested in Dhamma and retire early. And so it would be for people like that as well, who he hoped would then, could, some of them would blossom as teachers. Uh, there's a place, there's a sutta in the Middle Lake discourses about the impossibles. And one of them, supposedly from the Buddha himself, is the impossibility of a woman being a perfectly self-awakened Buddha. This often gets misquoted as, can a woman be enlightened? And um, that, that misunderstands the context and the Theravada terminology. But the sutta says, and I, I don't necessarily buy that the Buddha said this, that it's not possible for a woman to be a samasam Buddha, which means a Buddha who is awakened without the benefit of teachings such as the Four Noble Truths, not self, and the supposedly higher teachings, as as the Buddha was, and then. So all the awakened disciples of the Buddha, none of them are considered Samasam Buddha. They're, they're Buddhas in the sense of being awakened, more commonly called Arahant. And so when I asked Ajahn Buddhadasa what he thought about this, his take was that in the Buddha, in the time of the Buddha, and maybe still today, the circumstances would not allow for a woman to to do to recreate what the Buddha did. Now it's also people are raising the question, even this like in Thailand it's not possible for men or women to wander in the forest like they used to. And so a whole practice way of life has been attenuated and sort of domesticated into the monasteries by um, the changes in government. So what Ajahn Buddhadasa was saying, and he said this explicitly, it's not inherent to being female, but social conditions may not allow for a woman to to be awakened all on her own. So that was that was his take on that passage. But he was not saying that women couldn't awaken. Why can't people wander in the forest? Because the government, um, because of massive de a few things. One is massive deforestation. The forest be went from being um, 
it used to be the word, the Thai word for forest or wilderness is ba. And ba used to be kind of this dangerous place, but it didn't have a lot of value. So you would go in and cut down the trees to make rice fields or rubber plantations. Then it would have value. So it was kind of seen as wasteland, although hunters and herbal medicine collectors would go in. But with deforestation, the forest became valuable. And so powerful people wanted control of the forest. And so the forest got politicized. And especially the military, uh, the military controls the forests. All the land within 10 miles of, 10 kilometers of a border is under military control in Thailand. And so a lot of the forest that survives is on border areas with Burma, Cambodia. So part of it's the military, part of it's um, politicians, the logging industry, the mafia, all of these are politicians, business, mafia. There's a lot of intertwining. So laws were passed that monks need to get permission to stay places. They can't just wander through and stay where they like. And so more and more obstacles were put in their ways. I don't know if Venerable comes from monasteries where some of this tradition is kept alive. How how much can monks wander these days? Uh, yeah, not not very much. Uh, I'm in my fifth year as a monk. I, I try to walk a little bit, follow the path of the great teacher. But uh, I, f- I walk with a more experienced monk, and it turned out that it's, it's much more difficult this day. It's not as romantic as you read from the books, because all those uh, forests have been changed very quickly into road, and uh, they have some fence around it, and you have to walk like in the under the barbed wire the people put on it, and uh, and also because there are so many. Uh, illegal activity there uh, in the forest and sometimes because if we walk around and we see those and the people who do that doesn't like it <laughs> because the monk we, we don't have any uh, any gain or anything so we can speak very frankly about what's going on in the forest and when we speak out then many people lost those benefits so they they try to to pass the law that Monks have to be, uh, stay in certain monastery. We couldn't just wander around. We have to ask permission from the, from the, uh, kind of religious department before we can walk in. And I heard that in the very big, the, probably the last part of the forest in the, in the west, uh, thousands and thousands of acres. It used to be about hundreds of monks going there every summer to practice. Usually they just go wandering and then they can come out to receive the arms in the mornings. But now because of this law, they they can't do that anymore. So if if they succeed in doing this, it's gonna be the the uh, dangerous probably the last generation of the forest monk because we can't practice in the forest, and that's gonna be very sad. And also with the new Sangha app. Uh, the problem now is because the population in Thailand is getting uh, bigger and bigger, and the the government is more uh, kind of looking in terms of more economic. What is more economic? <laughs> uh, it's a par- the priority is changing rather than the Dharma as before, and a lot of land in in Thailand is belong to the monastery because people donate it to the monastery. And so the government has an eye on it, and they want to divide it into uh, do something else. So they try to pass the law that will limit uh, the land. Say, if you if you are in the monastery, the forest monastery, you have say five monks, 
but you have like thousand acres of land that they will say, well, it's too, too many for you, you can't take care of those, so you have to give it back to the government. So that also will be the ending of the forest tradition as well, because they, we don't have the forest to practice. And one reason many forest monasteries have so much acreage because that's what's protected the forest. If if monks are there, the local people are much less likely to cut it down. And so the danger has not really been local people. It's, it's generals, um, the crown prince. It's dangerous to say that, but the crown prince is heavily involved in illegal logging and a lot of powerful people. And unfortunately, the, the status of monks is not what it used to be. Um, both due to changes in society and some problems in the Sangha. So they even, um, in Bangkok, there's pressure in some temples to turn their open areas into parking lots. And this, this is under the idea that the temples should serve society and the monks should not be selfish. So, do, do you want to say any more about that? Thank you. So what happens to the forest tradition without the forest? Room bath. <laughs> <laughs> I think that's why some of us come here. She <laughs> still has a big forest and a uh, very beautiful piece of land. Well, there are still good forest tradition monasteries, but they have to practice mainly within the monastery. Yeah, and and also these days seem to be the I would say the limiting factor of the the land, the the, the practice, because um, most of the senior monks they will looking for the piece of land to try to basically reforest growing the the, the the tree back and and people still have faith in the monastery and then they offer the land to us but usually there's a uh, it's not a good forest so the forest monk one of the job for the forest monk this day is to go and plant the tree for the next uh, 10 or 20 years so we can have a forest in in the land that that uh, that we can practice Thanks. So, unfortunately, there are some very sad, sad, tragic developments. Okay, I'm, I'm looking through the list I have here. Let me tackle a couple questions and, and then we'll take a break in about 15 minutes. Since we've just been talking about the forest tradition, I'll respond to the question about how does Ajahn Buddhadasa fit with other aspects of the forest tradition. This, this goes back to what I said earlier about him being from the south and being the south, southern Thai culture relatively being, geographically it's separate from the rest of the country. Historically, it's, it's different and Economically, it's somewhat different. Rice isn't as important. Fishing and rubber are more important, things like that. And then the interaction with Muslims has probably shaped things and a little more Malaysian influence. So when, when Ajahn Buddhadasa started Suen Mok, as far as I know, it was the first modern forest monastery in southern Thailand. They had existed in the past and they may have even been the norm. 
But when he started Sun Mok in 32, it was perhaps the, uh, the first modern one. And it was built in an abandoned temple near the town he grew up in. And then later, when the original place became too small, he moved to a plot of land that contained some ruins from a temple that was two, three hundred or more years old. There's not really much knowledge about what that temple was, but the bricks and some, the foundations of some old buildings were there. So although he was doing a kind of forest monastery, it was like many things he did, a sort of do it, do it himself approach. And it was not directly connected with the the forest tradition of the northeast and north, which the dominating figure of which was Ajahn Man. And Ajahn Cha um, was somewhat connected to that, but not not completely part of it because of Thai Buddhism has uh, administratively and culturally two large sects. Or there's the small, the small one which has enjoyed more privileged support from the royal family, the government, and the military. And then the larger sect which Ajahn Buddhadasa was ordained in as I was, I assume you were. And Ajahn Cha did not convert because the smaller one that they're called Tamayut, Tanjef, is ordained in Tamayut. They used to try to get monks to convert from one to the other. Although nowadays the differences aren't what they used to be, but among the older monks now, there are some very bitter memories of uh, monastic politics between the small group that got a lot of privilege and the big group that didn't and resents it. Um, so anyway, Anjan Buddha, so he doesn't quite fit, whoever asked this question, was it, he doesn't quite fit with the larger forest tradition. Um, some aspects of that, such as Ajahn Chah, were respectful. There's a lot of mutual respect between Ajahn Buddhadasa and Ajahn Chah, though they never met. Uh, Ajahn Chah, who was junior to Ajahn Buddhadasa, reportedly for a while had a picture of Ajahn Buddhadasa on the altar at his temple. And so that's, that's a sign of a lot of respect. And I've heard from some of Ajahn Chah's disciples that, especially when Ajahn Chah was sick, he liked to listen to Ajahn Buddhadasa's talks about sunyata. Um, and Ajahn Buddhadasa thought highly of Ajahn Chah because although he was part of the forest tradition, Ajahn Buddhadasa thought Ajahn Chah showed enough uh, flexibility about things, whereas the Tamayut monks are known for being rather, at least where I come from, rigid. I'm sure they wouldn't agree. But um, so Ajahn Buddhadasa thought Ajahn Chah had the mix about right. When Ajahn Buddhadasa was young, he was real gung-ho about some of that and later felt he had been too enthusiastic and too rigid and he used the Thai word uot di. Uot means to boast. Uot di means to kind of, you kind of a bit show off, become careless in a kind of show offish way. And so he did some stuff to kind of show off how tough he was. And there's, there's a bit of that in the forest, that kind of macho stuff in some parts of the forest tradition. And part of it's just young men kind of working things out. All the testosterone has to go someplace, even even among monastics. Um, so they had a lot of mutual respect. Unfortunately, Ajahn Chah's 
illness which was affecting his brain kicked in pretty bad and he wasn't able to make it down to Suan Mok and Ajahn Buddhadasa never traveled so they, in the end, they they never met. They kind of communicated through disciples of each other who would go visit. So Ajahn Buddhadasa had some students who would go up there and vice versa. But I don't think they ever corresponded. When I once asked Ajahn Buddhadasa why he didn't go to see Ajahn Man, how many of you know Ajahn? Some of you have heard of him. He's the, he revived the kind of forest tradition in Thailand and was very influential. And he's from the same province as Ajahn Cha, from Ubon province. And he was still alive when Ajahn Buddhadasa decided to leave Bangkok and set up his own place. So once I asked Ajahn Buddhadasa why he didn't go to stay with Ajahn Man. It's written M-U-N, by the way, but it's pronounced Man. And Ajahn Buddhadasa said he smoked. And he didn't smoke like modern cigarettes, but more what we would call a cheroot, you know, self-rolled, kind of big old, uh, which, by the way, I used to smoke when I was in Peace Corps, they, common up in northern Thailand. And Ajahn Buddhadasa um, just didn't go for stuff like tobacco. Once when he was a young monk in Bangkok, somebody gave him nest tea, It was a hot new thing in the late 20s, instant tea. So, and he wasn't a tea drinker. Uh, Thais back then didn't, the Chinese drank tea, but the Thais didn't. And the Muslims drank coffee, but the Thais didn't. Now lots of people drink Nescafe and Starbucks and stuff. So he... He had this bottle of Nest tea and he made himself a cup and he probably made it too strong. But he couldn't sleep all night and he thought he was going to die. His heart was pounding and he was sweating. So that was it for him and caffeine. Um, I, on the other hand, was a regular caffeine user and he would just kind of laugh at me. He didn't, he didn't think it was like some big problem, but he... He didn't see why anybody would smoke cigarettes or or indulge in caffeine. But I I think also he didn't say this, but it's my supposition that when he had his ideas of what he wanted to try and do, and because of the cigarette thing and the cultural and geographic piece. He, he wasn't inspired to go up and see Ajahn Man and his, his approach was to go home and start, start his own thing. So. Also, there are elements of the forest tradition who are very critical of Ajahn Buddhadasa. There's, I would say there's a strong anti-intellectual streak I'm not saying all forest monks, but there are some monks who are kind of anti-book, anti-intellectual. And some of them see Ajahn Buddhadasa as a philosopher, scholar, and they don't mean those words positively. So they would say, oh, he's just a scholar, he doesn't practice. And, And then there are others in the forest tradition who had a lot of respect. For Ajahn Buddhadasa. Well, I I would bet that Ajahn Jamnian, who was much younger, I'm pretty sure Ajahn Jamnian visited <laughs> Suan Mok probably a few times, but I, I don't know that, but I would, I would guess. And who else? Uh-huh. So, I don't know. 
I don't know. Back then, the, they, if they were both in Bangkok at the same time, it's possible. But I, I've never heard that they met. Though, when Ajahn Chen Buddhadasa was starting out Suan Mok, one of his, one of the monks who was kind of an unofficial behind the scenes sponsor was a, a very senior Tamayut monk. So, in the early days, he, he was, that's another way, he was kind of a bridging thing. He, he was officially Mahanigaya, but because he kept Vinaya pretty strictly, and he did certain practices that the Tamayuts identified with, they they were accepting of him. And the current Sangha Raja, which means King of the Sangha or Supreme Patriarch, and Ajahn Buddhadasa were kind of friendly. They weren't quite friends, but they were friendly. So many, like five. Well, Jack and Joseph were Peace Corps. I don't know if, and then he was a yeah. He, although he was a Peace Corps in Sarawak, I think, which is yeah, yeah Sarawak's a Malaysian state, north side of Borneo. And then I knew a few others who were a monk who studied with me for about five years was Peace Corps. And there are some who were monks for a short period. Um, well, one thing is if Ajahn Sumedho might be a little different because he wasn't in Thailand, but if you if you're in Thailand long enough, you know that you can become a monk real easy. Like you can walk in a monastery and be ordained within a couple of days in some places overnight. So, so if you don't want to wait, like if you go to an Ajahn Chah monastery now, it takes a while. And in my case, I didn't want to wait. So I, I knew there were, that that wasn't the cultural norm cultural norm is you go to the local temple and you get ordained in a day or two. And you only stay in for a short period and then you go back to whatever. So I think that's part of it. But also if if you're in Thailand, that's where I really got exposed to Buddhism. Previously it was just books at university. And then I was exposed to it as a living tradition and People I really liked were were influenced by Buddhism, and and then I found out about the practice, the meditative side of Buddhism. And in Thailand's a place that, as I've heard it said many times, it's it, at least it, it's maybe a little less now, but the culture used to be set up to support support monks. And yet it wasn't as um, the standard of living was better than Sri Lanka, so it's a little more comfortable. <laughs> and it doesn't have as onerous a political regime as Burma. And there aren't any Peace Corps in Burma. So. Three o'clock, how about if we take one more break and then we'll come back? <laughs>